good evening to you all and welcome to Fascinating Futurisms, where I, Lee Francis, your proprietor and host here from WordCraft Circle and our partners at Tribe Called Geek, get to talk with amazing native creatives about indigenous futurisms uh, and their ways around that. Tonight we have one of my dear friends, we've done some great work together, Michael Shiasi. Uh, we'll get to talk more about all of his wonderful credentials as part of this, but I am very excited uh, to be able to continue this series. We started this series out last year in 2020. We get to continue it on here in 2021. We had uh, Weody Old Bear last night. So we're doing this in a series of three. We're gonna have uh, another one coming up tomorrow, which is gonna be very exciting. Uh, and this fascinating futurisms conversation features some of the most incredible indigenous writers, artists, thinkers, and doers talking and conversing about indigenous futurisms, building on the framework of Dr. Grace Dillon, um, we're just going to throw out some really good uh, uh, ideas and theories and frameworks around this idea of indigenous futurisms. What does it mean? Where is it going? How is it adapting? How is it evolving? Right? We want to say thank you very much to, uh, for allowing us to put this on. We are supported by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the New Mexico Humanities Council. Please note in anything that we say, these views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not ne necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the New Mexico Humanities Council. We have to put the disclaimer out there, but I don't think we're gonna get too rambunctious. I mean, maybe a little bit, but not too much here for anybody. But uh, we also wanna give a big shout out to our partners, A Tribe Called Geek, which is where these videos reside right now. So WordCraft Circle is partnered to be able to get this out to all you indigenous nerds in the world. We're very excited. We are filming this live. Anybody jumps on, that's super awesome. If you don't, you get the chance to uh, view these anytime you want. They'll be up on our social media pages and our website. So they live in perpetuity with these beautiful faces right here uh, where you can enjoy these throughout time. Once we're all gone, the only thing that's going to be left is the robots and these visuals right here. So. And I'm sure they'll try to do some sort of AI versions of this. It's gonna be, it, it'll be quite interesting. So uh, with all that said, I am thrilled to uh, introduce uh, my guest for this evening, a really great friend. He literally wrote the book on Native Americans in comics entitled Native Americans in Comics. Uh, is that right? Do I have the actual title? Native American Comic Books, A Critical Study. Uh, coming out of, uh, uh, where is that out of? You'll tell me in a McFarland. second. McFarland, he's also the founder of Alternative Media, doing incredible work. Um, he does work across the, you know, uh, the, the, the interwebs. Uh, you can see his stuff stamped everywhere, 2D, 3D animation, simulations, games, education, etc. I'll let him talk a little bit more about himself, but welcome to Fascinating Futurisms, Michael Shiasi. So good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate it, Dr. Francis. It's always a pleasure. I almost don't need to talk now. You've got me so well introduced. In fact, here's a sticker for you. So Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, but I'll put you on the spot. Uh, I've done it with all of the Native folks because I always like to make you feel uncomfortable uh, when you're here online, which means you get to talk about yourself. So tell us a little bit about who you are, do your introductions, and whatever you would like the world to know, uh, and then I will continue to uh, be able to to heap praise and all the wonderful things upon you, but uh, you feel free to introduce who you are and, and and whatever you'd like us to to know. Okay, no, it sounds good. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So, uh, and for the recording, you'll hear me switch back and forth. You know, say you know, Dr. Francis and Lee and everything. And as you hear, we're you know we're friends as well. So we do a lot of work together um, and different things, and we'll get into that in a minute. So. Um, welcome everyone, uh, Na'awi, um, Sujentia. My name is Michael Shiashi. Uh, Shiashi, I'm a member of the Caddo Nation. Shiashi is uh, Caddo for little boy, originally pronounced Shiatsi, and that was too hard to spell, so you got Shiashi. So I'm a technologist and founder of Alternative Media, a and uh, We do a lot of different things, and the joke is, you know, what do you do? Well, what do you need? That's the answer. And so we do a lot of 3D modeling, uh, AR and VR, augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, try to work in comic books occasionally, um, doing a lot of e-learning programming, HTML, mobile apps, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and you may even hear my coworker barking in the background who has just found out there's someone walking by. So like all of us, I'm, walk I'm working from home uh, here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, a scant a couple of miles occasionally from Lee when he visits in Albuquerque. So we do a lot of things. As Lee mentioned, um, you know, one thing I did uh, is wrote a book several years ago on how we Native people are portrayed in Native American in comic books. 
uh, and looking specifically at North American comics from say the 1930s on to the 2000s or so. Uh, and really that, that really goes to the core of what we're talking about today, you know, indigenous futurisms and how that plays out in stories and pop media. And uh, we'll get into the thick of that in a little bit, but really as far as what I'd like everybody to know, um, you know, I, I think that as we talk about our superpowers, right? And as I, you know, rip open the S on my chest for Shiyashi, by the way, um, that, right, yeah, see, um, that we, we have those secret identities. And so one of my secret identities is, you know, being this tech guy and I do a lot of programming and stuff. But the other secret identity is literally just being this person that loves comic books, that loves great stories, that loves sci-fi, pop culture, history, all that stuff. And what better medium to discuss than comic books and, and pop culture and film, but specifically those, because they entail all these rich, you know, artistic forms in one. So I think I'll pause there. That's a good space to pause. And, you know, I think when we're thinking about how obviously stories and arts and culture and past, present and future combine, this is one of the themes that has run throughout this idea of indigenous futurism, right? And as Dr. Dylan sort of framed out, I think six, five, six, seven, somewhere around there, identifying markers in the work um, that she's done uh, around what builds, like where are a lot of the things that are culminating with indigenous futurisms, these kind of frameworks, right? So these, there are these micro frameworks, these microcosms within the space. And, you know, as it all comes together and we begin to talk about, you know, how does culture influence that? How does it become, you know, micro essentialized for not only the work that like you're doing on the broad scheme of say digital technology, but then you have comic book work, which blends art and technology these days. And then you have your own cultural experiences, which blends kind of all of those and not those, the analog stuff. So how do you make sense of all of those, not, I won't say competing, but how do you feel that, how do you make sense and how do they synthesize in not only the work that you do, because I know that you do technologist work and some of your comic books cover that, like your work, right? And then how do you make sense of that from, let me, let me break this up. How do you make sense of that in the fiction work that we're doing, that you're doing? How do you make sense of that in the technology world that you work in as well? Oh, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, really, I think what you touched on is what I'm hearing. And, you know, in college at University of Oklahoma, I grabbed onto this. And I think there's probably better phrases, but I like this one a lot. And that idea of negotiated identity, you know, so we as indigenous people sometimes, you know, have to, you know, display blood quantum or we have to say, okay, yes, I am a member of this tribe. Look, you know, I perform in these cultural ceremonies. This is my auntie, this is my uncle. So negotiating through that identity is quite difficult, especially for indigenous people in North America and Canada, right? Because we have these different names and different identities and functions and the meanings and the intrinsic values of each of those. So what am I getting at? So the idea of understanding that we already have negotiated sort of a, a minefield of, you know, uh, treacherous roads is kind of setting the, the pathway for me, right? So when I do these things, I, I look at my identity, right? And the joke is I get to do all these cool things, but basically I'm just doing comic books and video games. So I have like the professional life of an eight-year-old boy, right? And that's, that's fantastic. I love it. So the idea of not only the cultural aspect of being you know, several elements in once, as you mentioned, of being multi-threaded and multi-textural is that same thing we're getting with the futurisms. And, and uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Laponte, you know, uh, Beth, Dr. Laponte, you know, corrected me several times to help understand as we work together with, uh, together on the editorial version for Moonshot, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that we push this forward. That was our theme, right? Indigenous futurism. And just like you're talking about, it seems like they may be competing in some ways, but really, she was so you know, gracious to me to, to tell me like, look, you know, it, it doesn't have to be literal future. It's not, it's in the name, right? But the futurism is the, the idea of the multi-layer that you know, all, all these time venues, if you will, the idea of the past, present and future are not linear, right? They're ideas that we coalesce and we pull from. And so whether it's technology or whether it's representing, you know, when we do comic books or things like that, is making sure I understand where I stand with it on this multicultural yeah. aspect, but also how it might support those ideas of futurism. You know, what aspects of the past am I pulling to strengthen my knowledge of, you know, suggesting a future that we can all live? What part of the present can I take and, you know, talk about how they did the same thing in the past and show the future? So the idea of that contextuality is really important at that point. 
Right. So it's a, it, it, it's framed in such a way as like it's the indigenous or it's the multi indigenous multiverse, right? The multicultural <laughs> multiverse. Um, right. Careful, we have to give somebody five cents now for saying meta. I mean, with and, and multiverse. I was like, everybody's you know copywriting everything all over. I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, we'll see. We'll see if it, it gets to stay up. You know, uh, we'll see who's competing. So, uh, you know, in your, you know, in I, I guess you know, kind of moving into the work that you do around like two D, three D, AR, um, and whatnot. And I know a lot of that. It, it te- you know, I mean, a lot of it's contract work. But how do you feel that your you know, it's such a broad question and forgive me how it's going to come off kind of blunt. How do you feel that your culture and your background in storytelling plays into that work, right? Because I think it's, I think it's important to kind of understand it. And I want to say that with a caveat, with an asterisk, because I was sitting on a panel years ago with Humberto Ramos, who was, you know, the illustrator for Spider-Man, right? When they had the huge sort of Spider-Man relaunch. I don't know, this is probably what, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago at this point. (laughs) And he was very clear because somebody asked him the same question. He's like, I'm paid to draw Spider-Man. I draw Spider-Man. Like my culture is not in Spider-Man. That's Spider-Man. He's like, I'm working on another book with somebody. There's my culture because he's Mexican. You know, he's Mexican, not indigenous, but Mexican national. And 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 I thought it was. I was just like, well, that makes sense. I was like, if you get paid by you know the House of Mouse, then you're gonna do what you got to do. Like that's 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 your gig, right? But I think because you know, alternative is your own thing. Um, I guess that's more of a question. Does it play in? And if it does, how does it play in? How does culture, how does storytelling, how does all that stuff play into your work? I don't know. No, I'm teasing. No, I'm going to start off with a joke. You're like, I draw Spider-Man. I draw Spider-Man. That's what I do, you know? Right. I wish I drew Spider-Man. No. Um, So years ago, again, this is anecdotal back to University of Oklahoma days, you know, like a million and three years ago, um, happened to be in an after hours discussion with uh, Stephen Judd. Uh, Yeah. And so... uh, and we were talking, he was talking about going to high school, right? Uh, and he was drawing a banner for a football game and someone walks by another native student at Haskell and says, hey, that looks great. Why don't you put a feather on it? And he says something to the effect, you know, he probably made it more funny as he retold, but he says, look, we're at a native school. I'm a native, you're a native. This is my artwork. Why do I have to throw a feather on it, right? Why do I have to demarcate this by a feather to show it's, it's a native art, right? So the same thing, right? When no matter what I'm doing, whether it's contract work or comic books or you know technology, the idea is still whatever I do is is native right. influence, it's right. indigenous created, right? And when that aspect of indigenous representation becomes important, thankfully I have the book to kind of lay back on and go, okay, here's the criteria I laid out in the book, and go, okay, here's some no-nos I'm not going to do. And so that also informs. And quite frankly, mm. just going back further to, you know, the book itself, like the opening chapter, I go, look, I'm not every Native person. This is one Native boy's perspective from an Oklahoma <clears throat> And that's it, right? So the idea of making sure, just like you mentioned the, the person, you know, I just draw Spider-Man. Yeah, I, I just do tech. I, I just do 3D. I, I just do comic books. But when it's important that my voice as a Native mm. indigenous person in the creative space is important to say and have validity, then I make sure I snap all of those criteria into place. All right. No, I think that's 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 a good observation. Uh, and somebody was posting about that the other day. They were, I, I think it was one of the things where I responded. It was like, why don't you post more native content? And I think the person that responded was like, everything I post is native content <laughs> because I'm native. And it was like, <laughs> right, you know. And I think that's I think that's been a, an, an interesting. We had, you know, I've had similar conversations in the series because identity plays into when we use the term indigenous, right? We're not talking about futurisms, but the categorization is very, very distinct and deliberate around a broad understanding from an indigenous perspective. How it's executed really becomes the the crux of it, right? So how is it executed within each cultural, tribally specific cultural reference and framework, right? And I think in in your book, when it talks about it, I think that's that's what you point out. You're like, hey, here's this broad list of things, but recognize that each individual group is going to have their own understandings of these things, right? So they're, you know, I, I look at it and say the same thing. I was like, 
I, I, you know, I giggle about that. And I was like, yeah. And the first publishing company I had has a feather. I like my feather. It's not dangling off of something. It's just a feather. And I was like, we're just going to keep that. It says native realities, feather at the top. There's nothing else to it. You know, very simple. But I was keenly aware. I was like, am I falling trap to our own stereotype? Like, what are we doing? You know, I was like, and I was like, no, because I think it's a little more tasteful. And this could actually be any company. It says native realities, but technically it could be any company that just wants to use a feather, right? Like it could be, I don't know, feathers and things. I, I, I just lost the, the train on that. It could be anything, you know, as a publisher that um, they could come in and, and put that. So I think that that's really, you know, how we're drawing out our own individualities and identities and then the cultural context that we bring into it, our individual and unique cultural contexts. I think context is key, and I, I think I'm going to pick up on that since you laid it down. And really, you know, you know me, and, and I do other things as well. So, I'm interested in martial arts, right? So, right. when you think about that, right? We don't. Someone that has been gone to martial arts, been trained in martial arts as a martial artist, when you have a situation contextually that calls for those skills, you bring it in, right? But otherwise, you're walking mm. on the street like everybody else. You may be trained to uh, to identify dangerous situations or elements. In that same respect, you know, in, in this case, we're talking about, you know, how do we bring certain measures of our own culture into it? Well, it's not always something you have to do, right? If, if the situation is called for it, if we need to represent, right, that's great. And then that same idea is, you know, walking down the street, I may identify, oh, that's a stereotype, that's a stereotype down the, the road of pop, mu pop culture and media. But when it comes my turn, I make sure that I, you know, I don't fall into those same traps. And I think that's just contextually, I think that's a great point that you made. So good. Yeah. And it's interesting how much of that is there, right? These various traps <laughs> that may be potentially of our own making, um, which in some ways I really feel that in futurisms and indigenous futurisms allows us to break out of. I don't know. It may be that little, that little key because there are all these traps that, you know, well, let me go back. I don't think they're all of our own making. I think that we perhaps, like there's the trap and sometimes we set it but it was made by somebody else. Like, I definitely want to point out the fact that like, we're not the trap manufacturers. Sometimes we choose to set them, but more often than not, they've just kind of been there. And they definitely were not the things that we established. Cause you know, I mean, as you point out in your book that most of the, you know, most of this stuff comes from hundreds, if not more, two, three hundreds of years ago in right. terms of how illustrations and media developed but I, I feel that, you know, and, and I'll take this, you know, how do you feel? But I feel that future in the concept of indigenous futurisms sort of allows us to dodge those things, right? Because we don't have to fall. If we adopt a, this particular philosophical approach or literary approach or a theoretical construct, then it's a lot, it's not as easy to fall into those traps because we're like, no, no, but this is what we're doing. This is the direction we're going. I don't know if you see that if you see the same. I have not thought about it, but I like where you're going. Um, let me kind of follow on to that. And, and what I see with indigenous futurisms, especially when we were working on Moonshot Volume Three, is that yes, you're right. There was that sort of ability of hey, we're under this new masthead or new to us to sort of flex against. So in that same respect, since we're on the just the cusp of really flexing inside of this methodology of indigenous futurisms. And, and what it means, and we're defining it, and, and people like Dr. Ponce and, her, and um, Dr. Dylan are, you know, providing that insight for us. It is. It's it's a great place to be. Um, you know, I think this will lead to other methodologies and other sort of you know philosophical ideas to flex against. In that respect, though, mm. you know, you and I have built up quite a cadre of, of information over the years, right? So that definitely informs what we do to not have those same pitfalls in this new milieu so that we don't make the same mistakes. So I think you're exactly right. We didn't make these traps, but we need to be a little careful, but then not so much because we're in a brand new system by which to, to try and you know um, see where it goes, if that makes sense. No, it's, it's, I think it's, it's this move of, I like to think of it as the way in which we were people that thought in spirals, right? And so, I mean, that's the way I always like to look at it. And especially in indigenous futurisms, I think the spiral is the most apt point because wherever you stand on the spiral, you can, all, you can see 
behind you and in front of you. And colonization and Western society came and took that spiral and stretched it out. So it was just one line. And when you're on one line, you can't, you can see kind of behind you, but mostly you can see in front of you, but you can't, you can only see the vanishing point in the horizon. So it's always sort of this, I guess there's this onward goal, but there's nothing else that gives you context around you. And so I feel that that's the part is that we're kind of re-spiralizing, right? We're taking the straight line that we were forced onto and spinning it back into place the way that, and I think that's, that's how I conceptualize indigenous futurisms because it's this idea of like, we're, we're, we're kind of re-spiralizing this thing, right? Like, like the way that I make my zucchini. You know, I'm respiralizing everything, right? So, um, and I think that kind of that 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 pushes that that pushes us into this new space, so that we do sort of dodge these, you know, these traps of pop culture representations, where it's the noble savage or the red devil or you know the the vanishing Indian or you know what is it the oh the tragic chief, right? The one that is torn between two worlds, you know, as they always portrayed like Jim Thorpe or anybody else who's. I have to give you up my love because he always had a white girlfriend, right? You know, a non-native girlfriend that he would have to leave behind because he was the leader of his people. And it was so sad for him to have to do that, but he would have to leave the white man's world, right? Like, and, and even if sometimes I don't think we, you know, like we fall into it. I was just like, man, like I wrote, I wanted to write this, but I just wrote this direction. I didn't even mean to, you know, it was just like, I wanted to write a love story. Ah, so I think there's ways that we're having to reconceptualize it. And there is, and I think what futurism does, and again, if you concur or you know disagree, I think it gives us the language with which to speak through this, to articulate in a different way what we're experiencing and how we're experiencing it. Yeah, I, I like that. And I'm gonna go back to what you said, sort of like a framework, right? So the idea is the futurisms provide that framework and just like I mentioned before, we can flex against it. And, and I think that's a great point that you're mentioning is sometimes, you know, as when we're creating things as indigenous people, we're, we're all too cognizant of all the traps before us by, you know, non-natives and, and some natives. And so you're right, that can be a, a little tricky and, and, you know, can be one of those moments that grips you. Um, and I think, you know, just like you're mentioning, finding these new areas or at least having an understanding, in your case, let's say that you brought up a really great example of the love story, of a romantic love story, and, and what might be some trappings of that, right? Well, it's the Harlequin romance thing where the native guy is strong, muscular, bare-chested, you know, no, yeah, just like that, you know, looks like me and you, basically, so, uh, but there's it's an like idea. I see, yeah. I like them better fuzzy, so. Thanks. <laughs> when they fuzzed out on the back. When they fuzzed out, that was nice. Right. Uh, fuzzed out was my name in college, but, um, so when we look at that, we have to understand, you know, there are things that you can, like you and I can do these things or anybody, any, any creative native person can get in there and do it. We just have to be careful with these, these stereotypes, the ones you mentioned even more. But what does that mean, right? We can go in and, and go, look, I'm using this cultural misrepresentation or stereotype and guess what I'm doing with it? I'm turning it on its head or I'm, I'm showing how the, you know, white gaze or the, the non-native gaze happens to it, right? So you can use it for all these different things, but it's tricky. And you and I have run into this before where we have to make sure that the idea and the presentation doesn't fall into too many of those traps. We have to make sure that we have a strong voice or a strong message that overcomes that. And I think exactly what you're talking about, the framework of futurism, but also understanding that it's okay to experiment. It's okay to fall in traps, but make sure you have a very strong message and voice going through. Yep, no, that's good. So do you think that framework is strong enough to hold up against the, the one, the regression to the mean, right? That, that we, you know, as, as we're pushing all these indigenous futurisms, there's 400 years of someone else telling us who we are as native folks, right? So does this, this framework and concept of futurisms hold up uh, you know, or potential, potentially hold up, it's hard to predict, but do you think it can? And secondarily, and I know that this is something around, you know, that Dr. Dillon and Dr. LaFonse have an issue with this, does it hold up against the appropriative nature of Western culture, right? So everything is now like, everything is now oh, hot native media. Oh, now we got native TV shows and everybody's like wanting to be like, it's all back to wanting to be native again, right? Like, 
does does this framework can this framework provide a a bedrock for native folks and indigenous folks to build off of without sort of seeing it crumble or seeing it taken away again you know i i jokingly call myself a technologist but not a futurist and so hmm. what i don't know what i don't have is the crystal ball right um, but I have a good feeling about this, and why I have a good feeling is conversations about indigenous futurism. I have a good feeling about the areas and the, the fertile ground of information that it has within it because of these kind of conversations where we go in and go, okay, look, here's what I think about it. What do you think about it? And I think that alone is such a novel approach that we haven't necessarily come to, you know, as, as creative native people yet. I want to see more of it. And, and again, yes, we have in, in, in small pockets. You know, you doing the, you know, uh, comic book conferences and conventions, those are great to get the discussion started. You know, you and I both talk in different places and it's there, but I, I definitely think this among others, and I think you bring up a good point. You know, we have a resurgence in pop culture with, you know, Sterling's, uh, you know, reservation dogs and other pop culture, you know, stuff happening in Canada. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of things coming down the pike. And I think this as an informed view and understanding the multifaceted nature of not only indigenous futurism, but indigenous people and our stories mm. is really where that fertile ground is going to lend itself. So the idea is, will indigenous futurism by itself, you know, promote us and, and propel us into the future uh, towards bigger and better things? A little bit, but I think it, along with all these other things, are really going to mm. be what we have to do. Like you were yeah. saying, contextually, we need to, you know, like a cook, we need to get a little salt, a little pepper, and get it going uh, with your zoodles that you mentioned. Yes, yes, with my my zoodles. Ah, and then that's what they were called. That's really nice to know. They're called zoodles. I just called them spiral zucchini. I use their formal title, Esquire, spiral zucchini Esquire. Um, so I'll go back just in terms of the work that you did around moonshot. So. How was that like in terms of, cause you came in in volume three and how does it factor into all this? You gave us a little bit on that, but how does it factor into the work that was done in Moonshot volume three? Um, and, you know, and the work that, that and, and, and indigenous futurisms. Yeah, let me first say that, you know, I was co-editorial um, on that, on volume three with Dr. Lufonse. In my opinion, as you've heard me kind of talk about, she spent a lot of time having these deep conversations and educating me to make sure that our voice was the voice that was, you know, that the voice of indigenous futurism was cohesive as we, we edited the book. And so it really did inform all the decisions within it. And I have to tell you right now that, you know, Beth is a powerhouse of not only understanding intently, you know, our indigenous stories, but understanding and sort of the 50,000 foot view of how they can fit. So big, big ups to her, big props to her on that. Specifically, what we did, you know, is really make sure that we didn't fall in these same traps we keep talking about, right? So yes, futurism, but no, it doesn't have to be sci-fi only. Yes, futurism right. can be a million years in the past, but what from that culture in that millions of years ago is brought forward? You know, mm. what can we do? And just as you mentioned at the start of the discussion, the synthesizing. Right? What synthesis can be made from this to really explore and put the indigenous story forward? Right. Specifically, you know, it was great to work on that, especially with uh, Dr. Lupanzi. You know, I had done, each of us had done stories in it for a while and I wrote the introduction. So getting in and rolling up my sleeve with her, quite frankly, was the first time at the helm, at the editorial helm. Uh, and yeah, it was scary, right? But at the same point, yeah, it was a lot of... Uh, moments like that but at the same time getting through it and understanding and seeing all the fantastic stories from everybody and then seeing how it did exactly that each person you know had sort of a mini story you know they got to introduce them we had quotes and stuff from just multi-textual so the idea again of the futurisms just like you were saying and and the sort of three-dimensional spirals that intertwine with each other in space and time is exactly what we we're trying to bring out Case in point, you know, I, I, I use that moment to, to try to do, you know, a space time uh, time lord like Doctor Who, uh, which was great, right? Because that's exactly what it does. Time twists on itself and you do whatever you want. So that was a bunch of fun. That was one of the first and only times I got to do, you know, I have like my own little mini bucket list. So making an you know, indigenous Doctor Who, okay, I check that off, I'm done. So Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. And I actually got to appear in that. So I was really excited to be a part of uh, Moonshot Volume 3. Um, 
also something similar. Uh, you know, I didn't get into too much of the science part of it or the science fiction part of it, but you know, writing a character that using traditional stories and bringing that forward to solve uh, the problem of interstellar space travel, right? Um, you know, and and illustrated by the incredible Sean Bayal, uh, you know, great work uh, all around. And I think it was really, even when I was thinking about how I would approach <clears throat> that, like my framework of the story, right? Because I had had been sitting on the story about, you know, this young woman that, you know, figures this out through, you know, traditional stories and through traditional learnings. And I had been, you know, kind of playing around with it. And so being able to formalize that was really an exciting process as well. And I want to say, you know, to you, thank you. And to, you know, to uh, Dr. LaFonse as well um, for allowing me to, to get to be a part of that with some really incredible writers and illustrators also. Like it's, it's nice to be in good company when everybody's a heavyweight, right? Like you're just like, oh, you're really good. You're really good. You, what am I doing here? This is crazy. I uh, you leave my weight out of this one. Uh, easy now, easy now. I'm, but if we're going to name drop, we should mention Andy Stale with you know. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Line three, and then you get to take your artist. I work with the you know famous Roy Boney on that one. So, yes, uh, the Roy Boney variant. Don't don't catch the Roy Boney variant. Um, Already from, got uh, it. Yeah. So okay, good, 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 good. Um, yes, we will hopefully get at that. The amazing Roy Boney Cherokee artist now featured on um, a really big comic company's indigenous front page. Right, right. Starts with an M, ends with an L, uh, something. But not, not just that, that, just exactly what you're talking about. You know, when you submitted the story, I remember, you know, and the little girl and getting help sort of from the past or from her relatives and that sort of thing to get the aha moment. That was a good, inter, you know, like contextualized story. And that's that idea of the the context and, and exactly mm -hmm. as we talked about you were able to flex against that new framework of indigenous futurism and found a really elegant you know way to, to navigate your story through and right. i think that right. same sort of navigation that other people are like oh wait okay I, yeah this concept makes sense when you think about it in my day-to-day -day life you know yeah i go to the same dances my my grandparents went to i you know i i, I look similar to my uncle or you know whatever it is we have these contextualized ideas that we synthesize and bring forward. So I think you right. got onto something. And there's these echo spaces, right? Again, that spiralized time where you're you're looking at it in a spiral because you can see that and say like, oh yeah, I can see the thing ahead of me and I can see all the points, you know, in sort of this infinite space. And I can see those reflected, you know, past, present and future, right? And I think that's the thing that comes up really often in the fundamentals, right? I mean, I think uh, Dr. Dillon talks about it as being the slipstream, but I think that fundamental is a nonlinear time frame, and I think we see that over and over again. That comes into play with, you know, I think in some ways like traditional storytelling, right? So traditional stories are non—they're nonlinear, but they're framed within a philosophy that's nonlinear, so that you have to understand the nonlinearity in order to fully gain the value or perceive the full value of the story that's being told, whether it be a trickster story, a hero story, a monster story, an origin story, whatever, there's a component to that, right? So like, I think as you see, you know, like it's, it's understand, I mean, I was, I love coyote stories. It's understanding coyote is immortal, right? So what happens? Well, coyote is basically living in memento. He goes and does something foolish and then time rewinds again. And then he goes and does something foolish and then time rewinds it. And I was like, it's constantly happening to him over and over again. It's Groundhog Day. It's any type of time bending, whatever experience that you want to put in, you know, in, in, in terms of moving forward. But I was like, that's the trickster's life. They're constantly dying. And I think that's, I won't say hilarious, but I was like, when we start to put it in a different framework, right? Now we can say it's like, oh, well, what were our, what were our ancestors telling us? What were her relatives telling us with the fact that we just keep resetting? It wasn't just one coyote story, it was 10, it was a dozen. Oh, and then this other time. Oh yeah, no, I know coyote blew up the last time. Oh yeah, I know his head you know, was completely severed by that rock that fell on him because you know, rabbit pushed it on him, right? Like, you know, it's it's it the same. That's why I, I actually particularly find the the old, you know, coyote roadrunner and coyote stuff, right? I think it's absolutely perfect because it is absolutely our stories. I've always loved them. I was like, but they're so violent. I was like, yeah, y'all don't know traditional stories. Like, dude gets like yeet, yeeted all the time, 
like straight up, like off, you know, and then, you know, and then the other times just like, you know, getting, getting iced by his own devices. <laughs> um, the song there somewhere, I think so. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's something to that. Um, so uh, we'll kind of start to bring this to, we'll, we'll land this beautiful conversation. What are some things right now that you're reading? What do you could do some good recommendations for folks out there? Um, either futurisms or not, but what's some good stuff that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, there's this book by Michael Schitt. No, I'm teasing. No, um, there's uh, some stuff really coming out in pop culture, like we talked about already. You know, um, several, several individuals with Marvel voices coming up for November and, and upcoming. So there's a lot of good things coming out. Um, I'm not necessarily, I'm just trying to catch up, to be honest with you, at this point. So I'm really, I know I should be caught up because we're all stranded in COVID and I had a lot of time to read, but in addition to the projects we've talked about, I also have to find time to read. You know, at this point, I'm really going to grab onto what you mentioned and that idea of the story. And, and we, we typically, we don't always, but sometimes we, rather than starting once upon a time, right, we might say, oh, when the world was green and dangerous, right? So when it was not quite ripe or rotten, right? So when it was new and fresh. So the, um, the in media res, you know, or in the middle of the action, really typifies, and you hear that a lot in Native stories as well, right, or at least I do, is exactly what you're talking about. And the idea of not a cyclical, but almost a, um, a perpetual, if you will, right? And the, you mentioned slipstream, the idea of continuum comes to mind. But unfortunately, when I think of continuum, it might be the Western influence. I think of, what, what, you know, start and finish. But that's not what we're talking about. That's really like all-encompassing three-dimensional zoodle, if you will. And I, I really think we should hold on to that. But um, I, for you, you know, I, I don't have anything that I'm reading right uh, now, obviously, other than the comics that I'm waiting to get. What about you? Is there anything that you feel like that typifies futurism at this point? That's a really good, that's a good question. I am, uh, uh, you know, I'm still catching up on comics, both native and non-native comics. So really excited to see some of the stuff, the, uh, what is it, Echo? The new Echo book that's coming out. Um, uh, or is out, you know, and kind of catch, oh. I'm waiting for it to arrive as well. I own the shop and I still have to wait for it to arrive, right? Um, for those of you who don't know, we own Red Planet Books and Comics as well. There's this guy, that'll be in the notes. Um, uh, yeah, man, I didn't, I didn't expect you to flip the tables on me. I got to think of like, what's, I'm really reading, you know what, this one right here, it's not futurisms, but I think it, it is futurisms, right? So it's this past reflection called Dawn Raid it came from uh, Levine Querido books. So it's a New Zealand book. It's a New Zealand story right there. That's actually on my list right now. I don't know quite as much about it. It's a native, you know, it's an indigenous New Zealand student, a Māori student that is, you know, looking, it looks like it's in time struggle. And it starts out as kind of a, uh, like a diary. So it's like diary entries, right? Um, which I'm fascinated by. So just given to me. So that's, that's on my reading list right now. It's got great accolades. So I'm really excited about being able to dive into that. So there's some reading for you. Yeah. And no, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go I mean, ahead. What that reminds me of is what I have been doing, quite frankly, is really diving more deeply as, as everybody else, but I have a point, like diving more deeply into our streaming media, right? And it's not just mm. because of the pop culture, but I think as we talk about these things, quite frankly, I find it important to invest yourselves in any type of story. Like it, it, you're pointing out, what's good to read and in, in reinvest our knowledge of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. For me, you know, the anime, new things, you know, like uh, Demon Slayer um, and all the, you know, Fire Force 8, that sort of stuff. Just right. getting into these stories and finding out why I think they're good and examining that and trying to translate that into some of our writings that we do occasionally. So that's really right. where I've been, through, like, going, why is this a good story? Uh, even using, using Dan Harmon's circle from those of you that are um, Rick and Morty fans, yeah. Did quite a lot. I, I, uh, that's, I go back to that. I was like, how do we tell the hero, you know, the hero's journey, but in the Dan Harmon way, which I'm a huge fan of that. So, so today, all, all the stories. you paid a heavy price for having me on the... It is true. Now you brought me back circle. to it. It's all part of the, it's part of the zoodle. Indigenous futurisms is just a zoodle, everybody. We got t-shirts coming. It's going to be fantastic. That's the tagline is indigenous futures is just a zoodle away. It's just a zoodle. There it is. See, this is why I bring you on. You're fantastic. You're helping with my marketing. Drop that mic. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Shiashi, for joining me. 
uh, it is always a thrill and a pleasure. And I, I just love bouncing ideas. I use these often just to hang out and talk with cool people. So I enjoy doing fascinating futurisms and everything in between. Uh, a big shout out again uh, to New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities for helping us uh, bring these great uh, academics, scholars, and everybody, you know, uh, creators, native creatives, everybody in between um, onto this particular series. We hope to continue this work at our new home at a tribe called Geek in terms of our partnership and collaboration. And if you get the chance, please go pick up Native Americans in Comic Books Critical Study by this guy right here. You can find a lot of stuff that we've got, Red Planet Books and Comics, or your favorite local bookstore or comic shop because there's really great stuff out there. So be on the lookout for it. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Peace.